You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. Today, Chuck and I are sitting here with the legendary John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin. John Paul, welcome to the show. John, thanks for visiting with us. When the band gets back together to do a show, do you just pick up where you left off? Yes, I mean, we didn't really know how it was all going to work. Um, but uh, as I said, when, when, uh, when we got going and when we started remembering things, fortunately Jason was there, who remembers everything. He's like a musical archive for, um, for all, the, all the songs. And you, know, you get to a point where, where you think, what happens here? And he goes, well, in 1971, you went this way. In 1973, you went into this song. And uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so he was really handy to have around. And then some things, um, I remember, was it, was it For Your Life? Perhaps For Your Life. I was playing it and I thought, I really don't remember what I played on stage on this point. And then I said, Jim, what did, what did we do at this, this point? And he went... I don't know, we've never played it on stage. Or, ah, okay, <laughs> that'll explain it. So yes, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of concerns, not really worries, but, you know, you had to, you had to pay attention. You know, after being apart so long, it seems like the band was really enjoying themselves at getting back together. Yeah, I, yes, I guess so, because at first you just want to get in and get it right <laughs> and get back into it, you know, because it's... It was a long time, a long time ago. And although um, we did a lot of rehearsal, and we did a really good dress rehearsal as well. And so, but dress rehearsals are different because they're much, they're much closer and they're much less formal. And, you know, there's no audience there. And, uh, and so, but we did a, a good dress rehearsal. And so it gave us the, the confidence, that, yes, it will work. You know, it was really interesting uh, seeing Jason Bonham stepping into his father's shoes, and it, it was quite emotional. Yeah, well, wouldn't you be? <laughs> I mean, he did really well. Jason did fantastically well. Um, and he was very enthusiastic, but he worked really, really hard. He was listening to the tracks all the time. And um, uh, apart from the rehearsals, you know, whenever I saw him at any other time, he, you know, he had a headset on and he was listening to, <laughs> listening to stuff and making sure that he got it right. And I mean, it must have been the most nerve wracking thing in the world to, to be in that position, to have to step into that, onto that drum chair. But he pulled it off amazingly, you know, and with confidence, too. He didn't just, like, kind of hang in there. He actually, you know, he did his own fills, and he was, he was, he was quite confident. And he took chances, which was great, because that's, you know, that's what Zeppelin was always about. From an artistic point of view, do you think that there's a different playing style between John and Jason? Specifically, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, they're, they're different drummers. I mean, there are... There are a lot of similarities. I mean, apart from the father and son thing, obviously um, Jason has listened to everything that his father's played and analysed it probably and listened to it again. <laughs> and so there are similarities. Uh, there's a certain swagger in the approach that they both have, you know, which is, is, uh, is great. It's great fun. Um, but... Bonzo was, was more bottom up, as it were, from the floor upwards. I always thought of him, um, and that's that's not so much the style, I suppose, in the last ten, twenty years. And Jason is more of a more modern style. It's quite. It's it's a little bit less of. I don't know. <laughs> It's strange. Bonzo was always a very complicated drummer who sounded very simple. <laughs> and and uh, it's deceptively simple when you listen to what, what Bonzo plays, but there's all, always tiny little kicks and little, little beats all over the place that just contribute to this, this feel, that he, this incredible feel that he had. The groove was was just the best ever. I remember when I when I first played with him the very first day because being a bass player, I'm th I hadn't heard him play before until the first rehearsal, and I'm thinking, 
I really hope it's a good drummer. <laughs> because for a bass player, and I'm the same as, the, as the, re, the reverse is true too, for a drummer, he's, he's good, he needs a good bass player. But for a bass player, if it's a bad drummer, or a not so good drummer, it's just hard work. Right. <laughs> and as soon as I play with Bonds, I think, thank goodness for that. <laughs> he's a great drummer and this is going to be easy. It's going to be fun and easy. It seems to me that Led Zeppelin had to be one of the first bands that had a real appeal to men and women. Yeah, yeah, and they'd all be dancing. <laughs> you know, it's it's great to see, to look out in the audience and all the all the girls are dancing. Could you give us some insight on the Amit Erdogan tribute concert? A staggering 20 million people applied for 18,000 seats. Does that, did that put extra pressure on you? For me... Pressure and expectations are the same for 10 people or 10,000 people. Um, there is no difference in, 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 for me. I just, I always try and do my, do my best if I'm playing to three people on the, on the sofa because it's the music you're, you're trying to serve. It's not really for, <laughs> and it sounds, sounds a bit odd, but uh, it's, when I play music, I just try and serve the music, do it justice. And the fact that there's however many people out there. Obviously, with an audience, it's different than just playing it on your own, you know, because you get the feedback from the audience and, and it's great, but that makes it great. But it doesn't really matter how many people are there. I mean, you want to get it right because you know there are a lot of people who've traveled all the way from... <laughs> all over the world you know uh, and, and and so you don't want to let them down but you wouldn't want to let anybody down that you're playing to you know they may have just saved up you know for, for, for a month to come to come to a show or something like that or for any reason so it's it, i always feel my allegiances to the music you know after an event like that it must really please you guys to see, you know, the reputation that has continued with Led Zeppelin over the years. Yeah, I'm very proud of it. Um, and we're good, you know. I know why. <laughs> it, was a, it was a really good band. I mean, it's very gratifying. And it, I suppose it is slightly surprising that it, it's, it's lasted so long. But I don't feel we've cheated anybody, ever. I know we've always worked hard on our shows and always worked hard on our music and and so I think I think it's deserving. <laughs> John, I've got to ask you. What was it like when the band was able to finally tour in luxury? Well, the uh well the private the private jet and the and the police escort that was just something you, you finally get to do. I mean, our, <laughs> we first toured America in a car. It was awful, <laughs> and then I think we, we we graduated to a Greyhound bus, and then we did schedule airlines. And I mean, we've done it all the wrong way, <laughs> the hard way. And so uh, <laughs> when we finally figured it out, or could afford it, of course, and uh, to, to to do it with a with a private plane, then you know, it's just uh, just you wish you'd have done it on the first tour, but of course you can't. Um, and yes. It got bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, and it's good that so many people can see it. But it turns more into an into an event than a musical um, experience, I think. You know, I've noticed, unlike the Stones, you don't seem to need that much stage to work on. Yeah, I mean, I've never understood that myself. I I need to be for a start. I need to be close to the drums. I need to be able to feel the drums, um, and. I know Robert always used to say to me, well, come out, you know, come out the front of the stage. And I'd go, oh, yeah, okay, okay. So I'd start at the front of the stage, and then I'd want to be, I'd move back through, through the first song. I was back by the drums again, by the end of the first number. <laughs> you know, and I like to see, see the drummer, and I like to... I mean, you'll notice in the film there's a lot of communication between us, you know, by you know, looks and... and and gestures and not so much signals but just you know 
when you've been in a van a long time you kind of you know what's going to happen what's coming and and whether it's going to go this way or that way or whether uh, sometimes you want to just tighten up and sometimes you want to hold back and, and you can just you know if you're you're paying attention all the time. This is the point. There's a lot of there's a lot of focus, and we always did it that way. You know, you, you, even on the tiniest stage, we would be in the same places. And uh, um, I play I play um, uh, old time fiddle as well, folk fiddle, uh, Appalachian fiddle, and and what happens is you you play the same tune. You play it like about twenty five times, the same thing, round and round and round and round, but the musicians sit in a really tight circle and you get closer and each time he goes round it gets tighter and tighter the groove gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and with with zeppelin that's exactly what happens we just as as the concert progresses or as the, as the song progresses you know you, you 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 pull in and you just get really tight and and you know it's quite exciting to be in that in that little circle why did it take five years for Celebration Day to be released? Five years? Five, that's like five minutes in Zeppelin time. <laughs> I mean, I'm amazed it's come out so quickly, actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's always the thing with, with big bands. It's everything moves at, at, at uh, a glacial speed. But then when we decided to put it out and um, we went backwards and forwards and I don't know, it just takes forever. <laughs> this sort of thing just takes forever. Everybody's doing other things and and it's got to be right as well. You know, you just can't just go, oh yeah, let's do a quick cut and push it out. Uh, it has to be right. If it's got to be us, it's got to be right. But I have to ask you, do you think that the band will ever get back together? Yeah, I would think... I think probably it's pretty unlikely that we'll, we'll do anything. I mean, you know, you never say never, but I can't really see it. Can't really see it happening. And who have you been working with lately? Played with Africa Express last the other week. I was with I did the Sunflower Jam last Sunday with Bruce Dickinson and Brian May and <laughs> Alice Cooper. Well, it was Africans before that, and I've played with Minibus Pimps in Aarhus. I'm playing with uh, um, Super Silent in uh, in in London in in England in November. I know, which is again uh, the Norwegian improvisers, and uh, it's I just do a lot, a lot of stuff. And uh, I went to Punkt in Oslo uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago now, and uh, and they. No, I went to Punkt in London, that's right, and they invited me to Oslo, and I went and took a piece over there, and I met Super Silent, and I played with them, which made the top 25 jazz gigs of the year in jazz, um, what, one of the jazz magazines in America. And, yeah, it just, I meet people from one thing and the other, and, uh, and they say, do you want to come and play with them? Yeah, sure. I mean, I did a lot of things with C6D last year, and I might do a couple... I might go and play on his record. <laughs> uh, you know, I just just like to play, basically, and make music. That's all I'm really interested in. That's all I've ever been interested in. I was never wanted to be famous or be on the television. Or uh, all I wanted to do, two things. My ambitions were not to have a real job, <laughs> although I never signed on, but not to have a real job and try and play music all day. That's all I ever wanted to do. Of course, you did have a reputation for being the quiet and the clever one in the band. <laughs> Both. <clears throat> uh, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. You said it. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, again, I just didn't really want to... I just, I just wanted to make music and play music all the time. Um, you know, if there's a jam going somewhere, I'll probably be there, you know, mandolin or bass or something or anything, really. Just because that's what I, what I do is what I like to do, you know. The rest doesn't really interest me. The rest sometimes gets in the way, you know. What you're saying is you'd rather be anonymous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hate, yeah. I always, every time I got to a hotel, the first thing I do is figure out the best escape route. And then, you know, disappear out the back. <laughs> before anybody notices I've gone. And being anonymous, then you can walk around the street and you can, you know, you can go to 
you can play with bands in clubs and nobody knows you're there really and until you've gone you know and then that's great I want to ask you about your guitars. You must have a large collection of like custom instruments by now. There's a big collection of Mansions. Mansons. Oh yeah, yeah. And his brother made all my acoustic stuff. So I have all my my mandolins and they're all man uh, Andy Manson. And he, well, he makes me a lot of stuff too. He makes me steel guitars because I play uh, bass. I, I designed a sort of bass steel, uh, bass lap steel, which I play with. Um, at the moment with C6 Steve um, he's great he's fantastic yeah and mad mad Dan Magnusson <laughs> but uh, no they're, they're, they're really nice people he's the real deal and it's just easy he just says he sends me a list of dates so you want to turn up play if, you'd, if not we'll, you know, we'll do them just the two of us so it's, it's, it's really good and before we go I do have to ask you this how do you see yourself as an artist I'm happy playing anything that I've decided to, I want to do. You know, I'm happy, I'd be on mandolin all night. I'm happy with a bluegrass band. Um, or with computer systems, electronics, and I really don't care what I'm, what's in my hands. <laughs> it's what's in my head and heart is what counts. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Okay. Thank John, you. it was a great honor to have you here with us today. Thank you again for listening to Pop Star Conversations. Be sure to click the subscribe button below and hit the red bell so that you'll be notified of our next exclusive interview. Thank you for listening to Pop Star Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist.